In our Walking in the Spirit documentary, we explored the story of two individuals, Chris and Sam. Chris had just become the new assistant pastor of a church. And Sam, well, he just got out of prison and was looking for something more in life. And by God's grace, he would soon find it. They were two guys with their own battles and struggles with the flesh. But God would allow them to meet. And Chris invited Sam to a Bible study. Take a seat. Okay, uh, well, let's keep on going. So God knows the, uh, the, uh, the, the plans that he has Absolutely. for us. Yeah. Uh, you see, when our old pastor left, the elder board wanted to find somebody who could, well, keep things moving around here. Absolutely. I mean, this church has been around a very long time, and the congregation feels safe and comfortable in the way we do things. Sure, sure. So we want to do whatever we can to help carry that on, not shake things up. Can I count on you? Absolutely. You, you, you hired the right man for the job. Glad to hear it. Huh. Don't shake things up. Well, that's exactly what Chris did when he invited Sam to the church. Hey, well, let's open our Bibles to Matthew 7, 7. Today, uh, um, all right, um, <clears throat> so um, I'd like to share a little story and we will jump right into it. I used to, when I was a young boy, I used to, I used to think that um, I could never... Now, before we can talk about what happens next, we first must discuss the law of Christ. In the book of Genesis, God reveals himself to Abraham and promises to bless all nations through him. Abraham has many offspring, but they end up enslaved in Egypt. And so God uses Moses to free his people. And after their deliverance, God desires a covenant relationship with them. He gives to Moses the terms of that relationship, the Torah or as many of us refer to it as, the law. But his people weren't able to keep the terms of that relationship. They would often fall into idolatry and over the centuries, they would continue breaking the terms of that relationship. But God did not give up on them. And through Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and many of his prophets, God foretold that one day he would write his law on their hearts and that he would even place his spirit within them so they could keep his covenant. And so the spirit of God 
became flesh and came to us through Jesus. And he lived the perfect life and died in our place as a sacrifice. And when he arose, he allowed God's people to receive the promised Holy Spirit so that finally we would be led into how we could be faithful to his covenant and keep his commands in the most holy way. Now, the Torah is really another word for instruction, and it largely refers to the first five books of the Bible. And within those first five books written by Moses, we are given a narrative of how God always wanted a covenant relationship with his people. And through Moses, he lets them know that if they can keep the terms of that relationship, then they would be his prized possession. It would be a kingdom of priests and would bless all nations as he promised Abraham. And so, as you have seen, they weren't able to keep those terms. They continued to fail. But Jesus, who was from the lineage of Abraham, was able to keep the terms. He never violated any of the laws and lived the perfect life. And so since he was from Abraham and he was able to live perfectly, his life and death were able to cover or atone for the inability of God's people to keep that covenant. And through faith in Jesus, the amazing thing is that now, not just Israelites, but all people are able to be God's people. And no matter your race, because now you are connected to the covenant through faith. And his righteousness covers you so that you can remain in relationship with God. But there is a big conflict among many believers. Because yes, in Christ, we are able to be the people of God and are able to be in relationship with him. But what about the Torah with its nearly 613 laws and commands? Are we to all follow each of them as the Israelites were expected to do? That's really the big contention that has followed believers for nearly 2000 years. And it's really understandable. I mean, Jesus said that he didn't come to do away with the law. But then you have Paul who says we are free from the law, yet he often quotes from its commands as a standard that we should all respect and follow. And then you have John in the book of Revelation who says that one day the dragon or Satan in the end times will make war against those who keep the commandments. And so it's interesting. And this is why we have to talk about this. And I think a good place to start is, well, why is there all of this talk about the law in the first place? Because Jesus is king. We have to remember that Jesus is more than just a religious figure. He always taught that he was king and that all who follow him are able to be citizens of his kingdom. Now, when you hear the word kingdom, a lot of people these days think of some religious thing. But no, a kingdom is a literal type of government. It's not a democracy, but it's a kingdom type of government, which is completely different. For example, in a democracy, we vote for who our leaders will be. But in a kingdom, the king chooses who will be his citizens. 
This is why Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. You see, it's different. In a democracy, people will try to impeach their presidents and remove them from office. But a king is king as long as he lives. And Jesus, well, he lives forever. In a democracy, if you don't like the laws, the citizens can vote and change the laws of the land. But in a kingdom, <laughs> the king's law forever stands. The citizens can't change it, and really nor would they want to, because in a kingdom, whatever the king says goes. And so for many of us who grew up in a democracy, this is really a shift in our thinking. But God is transforming us to think like kingdom citizens because you now have dual citizenship. Yes, you are a citizen of your country on earth, absolutely, but you are also a citizen of heaven in Christ. And so if we are literal citizens of God's government and Jesus is our king, the next step would understandably be understanding the law of his kingdom. So then, how should we view the law? Are we to follow all of the commands of the Torah or just the commands that Jesus spoke in the New Testament? Hmm. Well, one thing to note is that whether God's people were under the old Mosaic covenant relationship or under the new covenant relationship that we have through Christ, following the law or the terms of the covenant has always been about living in a way that pleases the King God. And so when Jesus was on the earth teaching about his kingdom, he taught his followers everything they needed to know so that they could live in a way that pleases God. And when you study the words of Jesus, you will find that his teachings had a unique way of combining old covenant commands with new covenant application. To present the ultimate way of living that is pleasing to God. For example, Jesus was talking to his followers and he says to them, you have heard that the law and the commandments say, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've already done it and committed adultery with her in your heart. And so here, here he takes the command from the old covenant but he doesn't do away with it and say, don't worry about it. No, he actually expounds on it and gives them more to follow. He says, not only don't commit adultery, but don't even look at a woman lustfully. Again, Jesus is talking to them and he says, you have heard in the law, do not murder your brother or you will be judged. And then he says, but I tell you, do not even be angry with them or you will be judged. And so again, we see that Jesus isn't taking away these law principles. He expounds upon them and even gives them more commands to follow. Again, he says to them, you have heard it said in the law to love your neighbor. But I tell you, not only love your neighbor, but also love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And so here again, he, he affirms the law command, but then he adds something new. So Jesus is really doing something amazing here. He is trying to take them from just religiously following rules to having the type of renewed heart that naturally allows them to please God. He wants them to have a heart so loving that they would even wish good things happened to their enemies. He wants their hearts 
so pure that before they commit adultery, they wouldn't even fantasize about it. You see? And so Jesus provided insight on the old commands and also gave them new commands. As it reads, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so must you love one another. So let's look at something that I believe will help to bring all of this together. So God is king. And of course, all kings have a law. And the duty of a faithful citizen is to live in a way that pleases their king. So imagine that this entire space is everything that you could possibly do to please God. And of course, within that space, you would have the Mosaic commands because they are pleasing to God. But you would also have these new commands that Jesus introduces in his teachings. Now, before Jesus came, all of God's people believed that if they wanted to follow him, all they had to do was follow these Ten Commandments and the Old Covenant laws, right? But by Jesus coming and introducing even more commands. Well, the next question is, is there anything else that we need to know about how to please God? Because apparently there are commands that we need to know that are outside of just what we had in the Torah. And so how can we know everything we should do to please God? Well, let's look at what God says to the prophet Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The prophet Ezekiel says that one day God will place within his people his spirit. And that spirit will be what will allow his people to follow all of his decrees and live in a way pleasing to him. Look at what prophet Jeremiah writes. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And so Jeremiah says the same thing Ezekiel basically said, that God's people could not keep his laws. And so the day will come when he will give them his spirit. And then that spirit will allow them to be faithful and live in a way pleasing to him. Now you see why Jesus had to come and provide a way for us all to receive the Holy Spirit. Look at what he says to his disciples in John chapter 16. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And that's what happens. When we receive the Holy Spirit and we follow him, we will satisfy all of the Mosaic commands as well as the commands Jesus introduced. The Spirit commands our way in everything so that we can please God in all things. And that is what living in the New Covenant is all about. And so for more on walking in the spirit and being led by him, we released a documentary that covers that in detail. See it. I believe you will appreciate it.
When you study the life of Jesus, you will find that he demonstrated what it looks like when someone is led by the Holy Spirit. But the Pharisees demonstrate what it looks like when someone is just religious and knows all of the laws, but doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Let's get into it. The Pharisees. They were the experts in the law. They knew it inside and out. They could recite it verbatim. They taught it, they studied it. But that didn't impress Jesus. Look at what he says. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Jesus warned his followers to not be like the Pharisees, because even though they knew the law and were the most religious people of the day, they were hypocrites. They lacked the most important thing, love. Jesus always taught that the most important commands were to love God and to love your neighbor. And the Pharisees were far from people of love. When there was a woman who was caught in adultery, rather than having mercy and compassion, the Pharisees wanted to stone her. They wanted to kill her. Thankfully, Jesus was there to stop them and demonstrate love. When Jesus would sit and eat with sinners to talk to them about God, well, the Pharisees would criticize him because he was around unclean people. There was even a time when Jesus healed a man and rather than rejoicing in the miracle, they rebuked Jesus because he healed and apparently that was doing a work on the Sabbath. You see, they were good at following a long list of rules, but they missed the heart of God, which is love. And so when you study the contrast between Jesus and the Pharisees, you will get a clear illustration of what spirit led relationship with God looks like versus spirit less religion. And that's how religion can be sometimes. We all know people who are just like the Pharisees, who claim to be so holy, but yet lack love. And you will find these types of individuals in all faiths. You may have seen a few in the Hebrew groups who believe that since they are the true people of God, it's okay to mistreat another race, especially one of a lighter pigment. Many of you have seen some stand on street corners and have white people kiss their shoes. And that's not okay. The question is, would Yeshua do such a thing? That's what we gotta ask ourselves, all of us. We gotta say, when we are doing things, would Jesus be okay with this? That's the question. And also in Christianity, you have many who claim to be so holy, right? And yet still act unloving. You are unholy sinner and a heathenish foul Philistine. And so this is not a knock against a particular religion. In all religions, you will have those who don't act in love. And it's not because they don't have enough rules to follow. I bet this guy here would claim he is very law observant. No, the reason we act outside of love is not because we lack rules. It's because we lack the heeding of the leading of that still small voice 
of the Holy Spirit. In the days of Paul, you had many Pharisee types of believers who did not like the inclusivity of the gospel message because they wanted to be God's chosen people. Jesus said, extend it freely to others. Give it away. We are the chosen people. We are the chosen people. Here speak. You would require no circumcision of these heathens. You require circumcision of the Greeks would of itself make of our movement just another sect of Judaism. For these are our instructions of the Lord. Be a light for the Gentiles and a means of salvation. Are men marrying heathen women? What of your daughters? Where do they find husbands? Now Jewish men marry elsewhere. And so we see these same types today religious people who lack love. And because they are not led by the Holy Spirit, they end up becoming Pharisees, unable to accept that Paul clearly wrote that in Christ, all people can become God's people, included in the family of Israel. No matter your race, no matter your color, and no matter your pigmentation. Through faith in Jesus, we all have become one nation. And so now we can continue the story of Sam and Chris. And so this new pastor invited Sam to his church. And well, let's just say he did not fit in. Great, great. Chris, can I speak to you for a moment? Just really quick. Of course, of course. I'll come back. You know, Chris, part of being a pastor is uh, watching out for your congregation yeah. and keeping them safe from you know, unwanted characters. So, do the right thing. Can I count on you? Yeah. All right. Um, our congregation has come to expect something kind of particular in their house of worship, and, I, and I'm really trying to give that to them. What does that mean? <sighs> Listen, Sam, um, church isn't for everyone. Like for me? Yeah, you know, maybe this just isn't the right place or fit for you right now. You know what? I better get going. Uh, okay. Thank you for your sermon. Yeah, yeah. Um, I should give this back to you. You know what? It's all yours. Keep it. On the house. Well... And we wonder why so many have turned away from the church. Could it be that many of them encountered not true spirit led believers, but just religious Pharisees? Who is that guy there today? It's just some guy, all right? It's just nobody. The reality is, if I want to keep my job here, I'm going to have to do some things that might make you feel uncomfortable. And that includes telling certain people to go. If they don't fit in, then yes. That's weird. I thought those were the kinds of people that Jesus wants there. And so Chris, pressured by his pastor to turn away a lost sheep, realizes his error. He knows what he has to do. God works on his heart and he apologizes to Sam. It says in the Bible that man looks at the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. What if we've got it wrong? Wrong? Yes! What if we, we come in here pretending to look good and we think this is how we're supposed to be, but really the church is supposed to be a place for broken people to find help? Well, I'm afraid that in this community, that is simply not what we want. Regrettably, we are gonna have to let you go. Yeah. But when a door closes, 
God has a way of opening the right one. God opened a door for Chris to pastor a new church, one that was spirit led and loving to everyone. And Sam, who was once lost, began leading their Bible study. And so for someone out there who has been hurt by religious people, don't let them interfere with your relationship with God. Because not everyone who claims to be a follower of Christ is filled with the spirit of Christ. I mean, just look at the 60s. You had people calling themselves Christians who would go to church on Sunday and then burn crosses in people's yards on Monday. And this is one of the reasons why many young people, especially those who had grandparents who were treated this way, believe that Christianity is a joke. This is why there is this growing anti-Christ movement among the youth. They don't want to hear about Jesus because they think about how it was so-called Christians who mistreated their ancestors. And so we have a duty, my friends, and that is to number one, be filled with the spirit and number two, to follow the Spirit. Because when we are led by the Spirit of Christ, we can finally show the world the character of Christ and what it truly means to follow Him. For too long, we have had religious Pharisees running around here claiming to be Christians, but God is raising up a people who will truly follow his spirit and live like kingdom citizens. And so, as citizens of the king, we have more to explore concerning his laws. When Jesus was here and teaching the good news of his kingdom, he would often talk about the Torah laws that they were familiar with, but would allow them to understand the deep meaning behind those laws. And Paul would do the same thing. One great example of this is circumcision. In the Torah, it's written that all of God's people had to be circumcised. But look at what Paul says about that. So here he's writing to the Corinthian church and he tells them, was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping God's commands is what counts. So Paul tells them that, yes, the commandments are important. Yes, of course, keep them. But as far as circumcision goes, even though it is a part of the law, Paul says that it is not a requirement. So if circumcision is nothing, as Paul puts it, does that mean that we should completely disregard it? I mean, Jesus did say that he did not come to do away with the law. Well, look at what Romans chapter two reads. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. And so Paul writes that true circumcision is about having a renewed heart by the Holy Spirit. And we see this idea echoed in the Old Testament as well. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 10, God tells his people he wants them to circumcise their hearts and not be stiff-necked any longer. In Deuteronomy 30, God prophesies to them that one day he will circumcise their hearts and the hearts of their descendants so that they will love him with all of their hearts. And of course, prophet Jeremiah echoes this when he says that the day will come when God will make a new covenant with his people and place his law in their hearts. And so this is the true circumcision here. Ezekiel, who said that God would one day give his people a new heart and a new spirit. And so what Paul does is he brings all of this full circle to show that this is what we now have in Christ. We have the true circumcision that God meant for his people to have all along. So even though we are not required to be physically circumcised, does that mean the law of circumcision does not apply? No, it does. The principle still stands. But Christ has fulfilled and revealed what true circumcision is all about. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So whether you are male or female circumcised at birth or not in Christ, guess what? You're circumcised. <laughs> Now, the reason I spent all of that time covering circumcision is because circumcision is one of the many Torah laws that are not a part of the Ten Commandments, but yet aren't completely done away with. They just have a deeper meaning and fulfillment that's different now. And as you grow in your faith, the Holy Spirit will allow you to see through scripture the deep meanings behind many of these laws so you can see how they relate to us in Christ. Another good example are the sacrificial laws of the Old Covenant. The Torah gave strict standards on what the people had to do to be purified before God. They had to sacrifice the blood of bulls and goats. They had to sacrifice the blood of a lamb for their sins. But in Christ, we know that these things were all pointing to the true sacrificial lamp that would cover the sins of God's people. And so here we have another example of how the law of sacrifice was not done away with, but it was fulfilled through the crucifixion of Jesus. And so in the new covenant, the principle of sacrifice is still in effect. It's just manifested differently. Do you see? And so this is again why Jesus says, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. And so when you study the law with the leading of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you to see how these laws were fulfilled in Christ and how many of them were for a specific time to keep the Israelites from looking like surrounding nations. God wanted to carve out for himself a special group of people that he could work with. And in order to do that, they had to be unique, easily identifiable, and very different from the other nations. And so it is a beautiful journey when you study all of these scriptures and you look at the history of it and allow the Holy Spirit to lead your way as you study it. Now, you could imagine the tough time Paul and the first Christians had trying to explain the new covenant to those only familiar with the old covenant. They got a lot of hate. You, what? All this ladies. I have seen this man in Ephesus. He teaches against the law. Look, he brings Greeks in the court of the Jews. 
the apostles were bringing in new believers who were not Jewish and were Greeks. And many of the Jewish believers were still not grasping the circumcision of the heart and wanted the Gentile believers to be circumcised physically. Continue. Why is he here? He must be circumcised if he is to mix with those of us that live by the law. Don't you understand yet that when one receives Christ, they must first become Jews. Go and make disciples of all nations, Christ said. And so the same debates that many of us have today in the faith about how the old covenant laws apply or how they don't apply, many of these same debates were happening then. But when we trust the Holy Spirit to guide our understanding about all of this, he has a way of leading us in exactly how to live to please our King in everything that we do. But I hope here we've been able to show what can happen when people just try to follow religion without being led by the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of Christ leading us, we run the risk of becoming like the Pharisees who literally wanted to stone the sinner. Without the Holy Spirit, we run the risk of being like those in the book of Acts who wanted to kill the apostles for teaching that all races could be included in God's people. When following religion without the Holy Spirit, we run the risk of being like the slave traders who tried to use Exodus 21 verse 20 to justify not only having slaves, but beating them. Without the Holy Spirit, humanity will always be what the Pharisees were, religious hypocrites. But, but with the Holy Spirit, we will be led into how to please our King as law-abiding citizens of his kingdom. We won't murder our brother because the Holy Spirit will convict us as soon as anger starts to set in. We won't cheat on our spouses because the Holy Spirit will move us to cast out lust as soon as it enters the mind. We won't return evil for evil, because the Spirit leads us to love even our enemies. And as we continue to listen to that still small voice of the Spirit, as we continue to obey His leading, we are truly obeying God's commands in the most holy way. And like the prophets foretold long ago, we will be what God has always wanted. A people with his law written within our hearts. <laughs>